Dear friends, uh, here uh, in the premises of the Institute of European Studies, uh, dear colleagues uh, uh, who are watching us through the Zoom, and dear guests above all, uh, uh, hello to everyone. Thank you for being with us. And I'm really happy that um, we have a really privileged opportunity to uh, host uh, Mr. Ote with us today. Uh, we are already, this is our third day of uh, um, uh, being together in a way and uh, his third day uh, in Serbia. And I think that it was pretty interesting and successful for the time being. And I hope that this, let me say, final uh, touch uh, will be uh, as good as it was uh, all before that, which I do not have uh, doubts, definitely. Uh, we were first day for a very nice lecture in Matica Srpska in Novi Sad. Uh, Mr. Ote uh, spoke from, uh, let me say, more Spenglerian perspective in a way uh, about the site. It was really brilliant uh, lecture. Some of the colleagues were there. And we had a small seminar actually with a very uh, distinguished and, and uh, interesting uh, audience, which I hope we will also have today, having in mind who is today with us. And uh, today uh, we uh, uh, concentrated actually on something which uh, uh, Herote prepared uh, uh, based on his last uh, book, uh, last big book, if I may say, from 2019, uh, uh, which is, uh, as we uh, called it, uh, uh, general. I just have to start, of course, with there are many things which we have to say about him, but of course, I will start with the, his book uh, translated into Serbian. Uh, it's, I have to say, a very famous book which still hasn't been translated to English, <laughs> which is very interesting to translate it to many other languages. And this is book, uh, uh, Slom Dolazi. Uh, uh, translated into Serbian in 2009. Actually, this is his famous book published, uh, published uh, uh, initially in 2006, The Crash Count, uh, uh, which made him really one of the small number of persons who exactly, precisely predicted the crisis which was about to come and started in 2007, actually. So this is really good uh, book, uh, very useful, if I may say, uh, not only historically, I wanted to, to, to mention, but also uh, the very interesting approach to the economics and uh, not only economics, but also to the uh, system of values and general um, approach to uh, the, the uh, sphere of, let me say, society, which and the shape in which we are living. So actually, he continued uh, uh, with the different kind of studies. And now we got the book, which is something like 600, 700 pages, I think. Unfortunately, the uh, copy that uh, Mr. Rote brought is not here with me. We left it with, with our friend uh, um, uh, Mikhail Antolovic in, in Novi Sad. And he is interested to translate that. He thinks that we should be translated that one day as some kind of, as he said, uh, 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 history of the economical system of nowadays. So it's, it's more broader perspective, as you will see. But before we start, actually, I wanted just to say a couple of words about our guest. Uh, I really have to say that we enjoyed very much and uh, in his company and some of the Renaissance figure, basically his uh, economist, professor of uh, economy. He was teaching at several universities, including Cologne, uh, Graz, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Etc. Uh, and uh, some of the interesting stuff is the mention that with uh, 24 already, he won the Mont Pelerin Society Prize, which was not usual for very young uh, person at that time. Uh, but he is engaged in business and uh, for or, uh, as his basic occupation for the last, what, maybe 10 years uh, already, uh, leading several funds and so on. But of course, he uh, didn't uh, like to uh, leave other spheres of interest. And uh, one of the most important things for us is that he is together with David Engels, uh, leading uh, um, uh, uh, Oslo Spengler Gesellschaft uh, Society for the Studies of Oslo Spengler. And they have regular biannual um, uh, uh, conferences. Uh, they have also the prize. Once uh, uh, the first actually winner of this prize was Michel Uelbeck. So it definitely, uh, in many ways, it is very, very active and interesting figure who is 
also public activist. He is also involved in the politics, which is not dominant, but also very interesting part. Since 91, he is the member of uh, uh, CDU. Uh, and uh, for the uh, recent time, he was leading so-called Vete Union or the uh, Union for the Values within the party, which was um, uh, some kind of, let me say, conservative faction in a way within the party. Uh, so some of the people who followed recent uh, uh, political life in uh, 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 Deutschland uh, saw that he was also very much in the media for some of his, as he said, political adventures recently. Uh, and I will stop here. I think that I said some brief introduction, but really there are a lot of other things that we could say about him. One of the interesting stuff we just mentioned, were mentioned with Professor Samarzic, he is originally from Plettenberg, uh, which we usually connect with Carl Schmidt, uh, one of the most uh, important if not the most important political and the legal theorist in the 20th century. So I will stop here. Max, it's really great having you here and I will ask you to take the floor. Yes. Well, thank you, Misha, for inviting me. Thank you for being here. It's an, it's an honor. And um, I gave back my tenured position in 2018, I think, or it was 19. So it was a lifetime position, it was a third of three university positions I held. So I said, um, you can't do everything, and um, I've been basically in, in the financial business, uh, financial information, value investing, so long-term investing, um, and I've built those companies myself. But as you said, Misha, I'm, I'm very much continue to follow political affairs and, and write and publish, and so this is a, a very um, welcome opportunity to broaden the horizon. I learned much about Serbian history, um, and... Uh, it's uh, quite remarkable to, to have a uh, history that in some ways is, is at least as if not more complex and tragic than German history. So um, very complex, very long history. I learned that I, I was quite happy yesterday. I acquired, in a, of course, it was a, a souvenir, but as a souvenir, an icon of St. Sava. Um, um, I'll, it'll hang uh, in, in, on my wall in my um, library. It, it, it'll fit very nicely there. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be here. I would like just to talk about few, a few trends in my latest big book, Weltsystemcrash, um, which basically predicted much of what is going on now. But it's no surprise to somebody having been trained in let's say political science, not uh, in, in political economy, not in the modern quantitative economics that is taking, let's say, partial models. You can do prove and disprove anything with partial models in economics, but in a holistic view, like Werner Zombat, uh, like some of the other figures. And that tradition is still alive in the US with very few people. And it was Robert Gilpin, who died a few years ago with his book, War and Change in World Politics, who I, I uh, received my PhD from Princeton University. It was Robert Gilpin, who it was always alive with me, but I saw it was an, a, a lively academic tradition in Germany. That tradition of political economics, political economy is not alive. We had the tradition of Ordnungspolitik to have a framework states at the framework for economic activity, but it's na narrower than what I would define political economy, if it, either it be Marx or Friedrich List or Gilpin or whoever. So let's go into these. So I just have a few observations about a few megatrends that, yeah, danke schön. A few megatrends that um, um, were there before um, Corona and that really make a lot of what is happening now um, um, no, this is fine. This is fine. Okay. And make it make make a lot of things that is happening now. Tie them into a larger context, and it's uh, those are varied uh, observations from a few range of of fields, and um, we can discuss this afterwards. I'm going to talk about the big geopolitical shift, and this is nothing new and no surprise, but a few observations there, and that has been with us for the past 20, 25 years, and. Um, if we look, for example, at Mearsheimer criticizing what is going on in Ukraine, he's not criticizing this because he's a, a peace dove, but he's, he, he would say China is a real goal. So I'm talking about the geopolitical shift. This is one. Then I talk about the 
um, dwindling of the middle class, something that has been going on in the US since the 1970s. Actually, Fortune wrote about it along the disappearing middle class and has been going on in Germany since the 1990s, so about 20 years later. But we are importing all these things from across the Atlantic. Then I'm going to briefly talk about world indebtedness and the reset that is taking place. So um, my slides are in German, but I'll just pick a few and then we can have room for discussion. So this is the book. It was uh, on the Spiegel bestseller list for 13 weeks. It was, of course, denounced and uh, not discussed in, in our newspapers, but social media had a good promotion through social, uh, so they couldn't completely ignore it. So that's when the, from the Erste, from our main news channel, the, the book uh, pope, the book critic, the major book critics said, this is a book that arouses disgust in me and threw it away on public TV in, 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 in the first channel. But it still sold about 80,000 copies, which uh, is pretty good for a, uh, let's say, book that is this thick. Um, this is my dissertation, which I finished in 96, 97 at Princeton University, and then I updated it with the help of a young uh, assistant and published it in 2000. And it's basically about the idea in the early 90s, everybody thought Germany is much stronger, will it become dangerous and this and that. And so I basically analyzed how much has German potential grown and will that change the style of German foreign policy? And my conclusion was it will not because uh, the demands have grown faster than the capacities. Um, and I, I distinguish between smaller powers that look for niches in the international system, um, middle powers that try to reconcile and, and be diplomatic and large powers that do what they do. Um, and so I said, it will, be, it will remain a middle power, but yes, we're a middle power on quick route to becoming a small power. So that's my sad uh, conclusion for Germany. And I did three case studies. One was NATO expansion, one was uh, uh, deepening of the EU, and one was military missions abroad. And, and so much of this, what I worked on in, in the mid-90s is now is still with us. And, and uh, so one could see many things coming. <coughs> Um, so let's go through all this stuff, uh, maybe talk about the term conspiracy theory, which of course has become very derogatory. And I knew it from my studies in the 80s in, in Germany. And we used it. We used it specifically for people who doubted the official version of the Kennedy assassination. So it was a very confined term. Now that term conspiracy theory is everywhere. Um, and it basically denotes if you're looking for people who are not doing the right thing, using power to do the wrong things and get together to do this, especially public officials, but not only. Well, as I, if I look at it in this definition, conspiracy theory today in former times was a domain of the left and was called critical social theory. <clears throat> and of course the term is about in 2017, it had its 50th anniversary because in 1967, the CIA in an, in an official document um, advised its external representations and um, um, the embassies to use that term as much as often to uh, designate certain people and then to use it as a derogatory term. So in that, since then, that term has made a very um, great career. Well, this is the first conspiracy theorist known in history is this Thucydides. Um, the strong will do what they will and the weak will suffer what they must. Um, and the other thing, of course, is very relevant. That is not absolute power and wealth uh, states are competing for, but relative status. And of course, his diagnosis of the uh, Peloponnesian War was that the rise of Athens started to bother uh, Sparta. And so at some point, war had to break out. I mean, it's a very dire prediction, but uh, that is his prediction. And of course, Graham Allison, longtime dean of uh, public uh, of the Kennedy School at Harvard, just three years ago, published a book about um, destined for war. Will America and China avoid Thucydides's trap? Um, and he did, did 27 case studies of similar situations that, well, nine went well. So at least 
one third went well. So there's some hope, but we have to study these things to avoid running into them by mistake. And maybe we're just running into them by mistake or by design as we are speaking, who knows? Well, what time lies, we know this, this was, uh, uh, I don't have to go into this. Um, this it was designed for German audience. I mean, the awareness here is of course higher, but I mean, there's a significant faction of people in Germany that are aware of this, but it's of course not the majority, but um, false flags. Um, of course, if you start speaking out about those things, uh, this is me and some major TV shows. Um, and I had a, let's say, a subscription to those shows because there are not so many experts around. But when you speak out more openly, of course, this happens, you know, this <clears throat> cancel culture. Um, of course, humans are very much to be influenced by the mood of the times. I mean, Le Bon, I read him when I was still a student at, at, at high school. It was in my father's library, so that left an impression. I had read Spengler by the time, so even I told you, Misha, when I got the prize of the Montpellier Society, I was already a Spenglerian by heart, so I was able to camouflage whatever. <laughs> and, but uh, it was on liberal free trade, so it was, it was a relatively easy exercise. Um, Kahneman, I can recommend for mechanisms in the brain that lead us to run with the crowd, that lead us to lead to the wrong dis decisions. Nobel Prize winner for behavioral economics in Princeton, got his Nobel Prize in 2003, uh, Daniel Kahneman. So he writes about all these mechanisms in, in the brain that lead us collectively to make very impulsive or wrong decisions in wartime, especially, uh, or be susceptible to propaganda. And actually, um, it's not much different at the stock exchanges. Stock exchanges are very irrational in the short run. So if you manage to keep somewhat rational, you make money. But it's not that easy to keep to stay rational. So um, rational and patient, I should say, that is important. Um, I like this book. It's pretty good. I mean, he goes, of course, fully transhumanist. This is his leaning, but the analysis part is good. So. Um, um, and um, so we are a species and, and we have 98% of our, we, we like to think of, of ourselves as, as uh, intellectuals, as uh, uh, emancipated, as thinkers, but 98% of our genes are chimpanzee. I mean, that's we share 98% and lots of our behavior is socio-biologically not predetermined, but let's say shaped, framed. So we can emancipate from those mechanisms and those programs, but it's, it's a lot of work and it's not easy. And there's always a danger of falling back. And the, you can see that in mass hysteria in the COVID pandemic. Uh, you see it now in Germany. I mean, uh, you see old, so, um, I mean, we're, we're a weak species. We're, on a, we're also a social species. I mean, just one example, there's a Robin Dunbar who I met uh, two or three years ago. He won another prize I'm sponsoring. Um, and um, he wrote some brilliant articles. He's an evolutionary, evolutionary biologist about the origins of, of language. And of course, language is not to discuss problems. Language is to, to mark social hierarchy and social status and status within the group. That's the origin. Of course, it evolved. Um, but uh, so language has that aspect also, and still very much so. So let's uh, just flip through this and go through, well, just, I mean, I'm now, since you mentioned the crash book, and now I did a second one, Weltsystem crash, world system crash. There's 13 years in between, and I didn't do anything else about crashes in between. I mean, at, at least not in publications. I published on a whole range of issues, but of course, uh, once a crash prophet always, or they, right now, I mean, in between, I was, um, Call upon as an expert, but now it's it's uh, convenient to pull out the label crash profit again. So I mean, this is a career you have to live with it from from crash profit to serious expert back to crash profit. So we'll see how that goes uh, and continues to go. Um, so the Spiegel schreibt der Weltuntergänger, also the world, the doomsayer. Um, um, uh, yeah, now back to crash profit. Das düstere Geschäft mit der Angst. The, the, the business with this fear, which is of course nonsense. And uh, 
this is three years ago, an economic columnist and professor wrote about the next crisis would be tougher than 2008. So people are picking up on this and we're in this crisis now. But uh, of course, it's always how you frame it. Just um, a short history of my macro prognosis about financial markets and green is bullish and red is bearish. And you see bullish is by way uh, predominant. Otherwise, I be, wouldn't be able to, to make money really at, at the stock exchange. And it's, it's pretty okay, the score, but uh, that's another story. So, I mean, the framing in the public and what you do are two, two things. And of course, I base myself my thoughts on the realistic school of foreign policy, to Kiedidis, Hobbes, um, Machiavelli, Carl Schmidt, there he is, Haushofer, an interesting figure to be studied more closely, tragic figure, very tragic figure, Kissinger, Brzezinski, and actually towards the end of his life, Brzezinski started to write some pretty sensible things. I mean, if you look at his last two or three years, um, so, um, and of course, Kissinger wrote, good things about Ukraine or about the conflict in, in 14, even in the International Herald Tribune. So, but now I saw a piece in Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung denouncing the realist school of foreign policy and how it was wrong. So, I mean, this is the level of propaganda even the best German media have gone. And I have, I grew up with Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. It was on my father's desk and I did read it as a youngster every once in a while. I I'm not reading it anymore. I can't, can't bear it. Um, of course, the other side here is Jean-Jacques Rousseau. I mean, this is very placative and this is very simple. As, uh, but uh, the other one is Norman Angel, probably not known to, to all, of these, uh, all of the people here, who in 1912 or 13 wrote a big book called The Great Illusion. He's an Englishman. He wrote about how Germany and England are so intertwined that war could never break out. It would be way too costly. So this will not happen. And then that book was a bestseller, and we know what two years later happened. And for his good predictions, he got the Nobel Peace Prize in 1933 or something like this. So, um, I mean, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, the hit ratio there, and the let's say the accuracy of those prizes can be questioned, even today. So, um, Robert Gilpin, in some ways, brought me back uh, with those large cycles. And we have, and I do think, and that was the more philosophical lecture we talked, uh, I had in, in Novi Sad. Um, um, we have big global cycles of about 80 years. And after 80 years, there's a big crisis. And this may not always happen. It may be different, but there is a cyclical nature to, to these things. And um, of course, there's three views of history. There's the chaotic view um, that early people have, that events are unconnected or it's the spirits, this happens, that happens. There's not really a concept of time except things happen and there's some force behind it and then the next thing happens and so on. And then there is actually the cyclical view is the earlier view, not the linear view, which also, of course, in, in, in Greek thought was quite prevalent. Um, that there are cycles in history, like Polybius or Aristoteles with a classical change of government forms. Um, and nowadays, of course, most people have a linear view. There's always progress. I mean, as uh, uh, Erich Honecker said, the last uh, GDR party chairman and Staatsratsvorsitzende, vorwärts immer, rückwärts nimmer. Ahead always, backwards never. Well, that is, of course, socialist doctrine, but it could also be capitalist doctrine. And that's not always true either. And Ray Dalio, the, um, um, la, the, the very successful hedge fund manager, one of the richest Americans writes about cycles. And, uh, and he says, well, whenever I buy, write about cycles, especially long-term cycles, people's eyebrows go up as if I was talking about astrology. Um, but I'm just talking about uh, events that are uh, happening in a logical order, driven by logical causes. And so it's, it's patterns I'm talking about and as, a, as a tool of analysis. And Gilpin has this big cycle, the hegemonic cycle. And I just also quote John Maynard Keynes that the, uh, in his 
brilliant book um, on the economic consequences of the 1919 peace treaty where he was a young negotiator and he left or assistant and he left he was 28 said i can't take this anymore i have to leave and who would leave today state service at 28 to an uncertain future he did and he couldn't find a publisher for the book so he published it by himself i mean these are all small little details that you that are forgotten but he said that the big events in world history are driven by are driven by long-term secular small changes that occur over a long time and when they happen then they're attributed to the uh, idiocy of, of statesmen or the fanatism of uh, of uh, some uh, atheists or re religious zealots but basically there's long-term causes behind them it's a great quote um, and so what are the causes against uh, um, uh, for Gil Gilpin? We have a, a hegemonic power that is superior for what reason soever, and that hegemon in, is uh, defining the rules, and of course it does it for its own favor, but it's so powerful that it can look for some reconciliation so the others also have some um, uh, benefit from it. And then the hegemon gets used to its role of privilege and starts to exploit it and new powers arise and then the new powers get really powerful and then we have instability, multipolarity and mostly and often war. And that happened throughout modern history, it happened quite a few times, it happened around 1900 to 1914 when Germany and the US rose and Japan. And Britain was becoming weaker before that it happened when the Dutch trading empire collapsed and Britain became weaker than before that when the Habsburg empire collapsed. So we have those phases and we clearly see that happening with the US and China nowadays. And um, this is the size of the economy and uh, in, by some measures, if you use purchasing power parity, I mean, Nominally, Chinese GDP is still 20% below US GDP, but in terms of actual goods and services produced, it surpassed the US already. So it's getting very powerful, and that is the megatrend of today's times, and, and uh, that is shaping everything else. And so I, talked about, I talk about this in the book, two chapters, and of course we know this, the Belt and Road Initiative, it's just um, quite um let's say interesting that we have unrest uh let's say the rohingya uh, in boma nobody knew about them before and now the belt and road initiative goes through that territory so there's unrest we have unrest in the border regions of pakistan and india one part of the belt and road goes through there and uh well, now we have unrest to the west of, of russia not unrest but even more even if it's um some people call it the military operation. Of course, it's a full-scale war. Um, so um, personally, I would say, of course, China uses this very smartly and very strategically, but I still prefer this to bombs, uh, I must say, this, this way of imperialism, but whatever. I mean, so there's a big, of course, and I was in Peru. I wrote the final chapters or did the final editions in Peru last in the summer of 19. and shortly after they had they be they had a state crisis and uh, well uh, simultaneously uh, china invested in in one of the southern parts of peru and will build a railroad to the other side of this uh, and south america to to uh, brazil and argentina so there's a lot of things going on um, behind the surface because we have uh, this huge concentration of military bases, nothing new to you. And this um, ellipsis is the, the geopolitical ellips ellipsis where 80% of the world's natural oil and gas reserves are. So one can see certain the coincidences there. This is the um, Navy um, armament race. Let's see, I'll go back. China, the US, and uh, maybe in about seven to eight years, we will have parity. So it's, it's a dangerous moment. It's a dangerous moment. Um, of course, the US is leading by far in terms of aircraft carrier groups, uh, mode of power projection, whereas uh, um, China is much stronger in small battleships um, for, for short range uh, uh, operations. 
Of course, this is the ta uh, tonnage of uh, Imperial Germany and Imperial Britain. We see, I mean, Britain's two Navy standard before World War I that the Navy should always be able to beat the next two navies combined. And of course, these are dangerous developments. And I just, I already quoted Graham Ellison. Well, we know Brzezinski and his grand chessboard. I mean, should be in this, I mean, um, in this audience, the book should be well known, but uh, Robert Kaplan, a neoconservative, this is way back, wrote a book about warrior politics. We should leave Judeo-Christian values, we need warrior values. That was his claim. Um, we need to be a warrior nation. Um, these things are mainstream books in, in the US. Um, and my friend Andy Basevich, a very fine gentleman, he used to be military officer and he was a colleague of mine at American University. He wrote this book about American empire in 2003 with Harvard University Press, highly, highly recommended. And Andy is a public official and military officer as fine as they come as one of his sons got killed in Iraq. And, uh, but it's, it's a very good book. It's a very uh, insightful book. Talking about the uh, US military commanders, the four or five major high command, so to say, being way more powerful than any US ambassador and basically being prefects. Um, so that's his description in the book. Um, of course, the interventions, which the theory was, would go down much after the Cold War, uh, in fact, increased quite a lot. And I've, I've been showing this thing since about 2014, um, where we have unrest. And there's a certain geopolitical concentration of a good cause. You could add Venezuela and so on and so forth. Um, and my question always was, who is next? Uh, but sometimes you just repeat scripts that were already tried before. Of course, mass migration as a weapon. There is this book by Kelly Greenhill, um, I think uh, University of Rochester or something like, or uh, up there in, in Ohio or in New York, upstate New York, mass migration as a weapon. Um, we know this one, the heartland theory. So um, I have three scenarios on page 398 in my, in my book, Weltsystem Crash, and they are Unfortunately, pretty. my prognosis was pretty good, um, which I, I'm not proud of because I'd rather be wrong. Um, one was a new Cold War, which I thought would be very likely. We have a Chinese bloc, an American bloc, and uh, we have uh, proxy wars, we have uh, trade wars, we have all of these things, we, it could escalate. So we have a new division in Europe or east of Europe, whatever, we have an American sphere, we have a Chinese sphere, and this looks more like it's happening. And I said, this is the most likely scenario. Scenario two is a big war, which I said is also not quite unlikely, not as likely as one, but the danger is there. And scenario three, which was my preferred one, would have been a multipolar world, a Western bloc, a uh, Chinese bloc, and Europe finding its own way. Because that looks like wishful thinking. And I said, even then I said, uh, likelihood is rather small. Um, so rarely does a lecture go with one, without one Spengler quote. Um, and he actually coined this for Germans in the, in the 20s and said to, to renounce a world politics means still to suffer from its consequences. Yeah, you can renounce it, you can, uh, but you still will have to suffer the consequences. And uh, it's so prescient. And of course, uh, Richard von Weizsäcker, our esteemed uh, federal president um, in the early 80s, uh, once said, well, from the Machtvergessenheit, uh, Versessenheit zur Machtvergessenheit. So from obsession with power to obliviousness with power. And that does pretty much shape German thinking. And uh, I, I'm afraid to say. So this is the big trend, and I just touch on the other ones briefly. Um, we have the uh, decline of the middle class, and this is a big problem for democracy. There's a good book by a professor of neuroscience at 
University of Chapel Hill, Columbia, uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, the broken ladder is called. And it's very, it's, it's popular, but it quotes a lot of studies. And it's a very good book because basically what he says is, of course, we're social animals. We have to compare, we have to compete. We have to be able to rise. We so have to have to realistic goals within society. Of course, society is hierarchical. Um, and so, of course, it's a ladder. But if the steps become too wide apart, or if you don't even see the next rung in the ladder, you have a problem with society, you have a problem with democracy. And that is what has been happening in the US for more than 40 years now, and in Germany for more than 20 years now. Um, and um, this is an interesting uh, analysis he quotes, it's not his, but uh, um, Payne uh, quotes it, and it basically makes a simple correlation between inequality and the uh, index of social problems, let's say mortality, infant mortality, crime, drug abuse, and so on and so forth. So it's not absolute wealth that drives these things, it's, it's inequality. The more inequal, inequal, the more crime, the more uh, drug abuse, and so on and so forth. And you see Portugal and the US up there, and one is relatively poor, one is relatively rich. Um, and you see Central and Northern European Europe down there, although Germany is rapidly, rapidly drifting into, let's say, an Americanized mode. Uh, I mean, there's big debates about racism at the police now in Germany, which is something, of course, we didn't have in that way because there were no real races in the sense i mean there was crimes in uh in 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 the world war and under the nazi dictatorship um, but other than that it was a pretty homogenous society so you didn't have ra racism at the police but of course you always had it in the united states where you had separate segregation separation violence and so on and so forth so we now have hypothetical debates and uh, about, about these things and they're taken very seriously and even i mean i i'm happy to discuss this as my um older daughter from a previous relationship she is um just finishing her abitur and beginning her studies and we discuss these things but of course she's being influenced by the uh, by the spirit of the times but at least we're discussing it and she says papa uh, i may not be of your opinion but i can discuss with you because you're listening so i said well so that's something <clears throat> um or the polarization of the U.S. Congress. I mean, they use some measure of how, divid how divided uh, the country is between Democrats and Republicans. Or what goes line in line with this, and I see this in Germany, is that the tendency for people to vote outside party lines is shrinking. So uh, when, when I ran for president uh, as a CDU member being proposed by the IFD, of course, that created some, some stir in the country. So one, one um, driver of this is not the only, it's tax policies, everything. It's a policy that favors the rich. And even Fortune writes this, uh, the uh, American Capitalist Magazine, or Warren Buffett said that 30 years ago, the, the richest investor. So there's people, wealthy people in the US that criticize this. We have a policy favoring the rich, giving stuff to the very poor, but uh, clearly disadvantaging the middle classes uh, and the small business. And um, one of this is, of course, low interest rates. They drive up asset prices, real estate, stocks, everything. If you have money, you can borrow at very low rates. You can buy more. Um, so I've, been, I've benefited from this, but I don't feel like we deserve this. So there's some big changes coming as we are speaking, because we're entering clearly a completely different phase of the economic system, not only of the world political system, but also of the economic system. Uh, to the left are the asset prices. This is already a while back, but still, which is basically favoring those who have significant assets. And on the right are the real prices, wages, uh, GDP, and so on and so forth. Dalio, the hedge fund analyst just uh, said, well, whenever we have a very unequal income distribution or wealth distribution, we have populism. And there's something behind that. Um, so the upper 0.1%, 0.1% now own more than 20% of national wealth in the US. And they did so in the 20s and 30s. 
and between it was down to 5%. Now, if you think 0.1% own 5%, that's still pretty significant, but uh, was much more equal in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Uh, that's a big, tr and this will reverse. I mean, these things go in cycles also. Um, and these are, again, two very wealthy people who criticize this. Um, very wealthy people, billionaires who made their money in the stock markets. Um, so we have this end game. Um, talked about it for the first time in 2015 when I thought, well, we're now reaching the end game. I was not the first to talk about it, but a uh, stock uh, gold manager, uh, fund manager in Holland talked about the great, now the big reset in 2014. I mean, we are in the reset as we are speaking and the result is still open. Um, a German fund manager talked about it in 16. So the reset, the end game. The, this is the development of global debt uh, as a percentage of GNP where it's 360%. Um, and debt as such is not the problem as long as the machine is running. I mean, as, if interest rates are low, as long as you can service your debt, but the higher the debt gets, you, you borrow and then you lend out. So you have levels and layers of debt piled the top on each other. So as long as the machine is running, that will keep running. But of course, the more layers you have on top of each other, the more fragile the whole system gets. And we are at that stage right now. Um, and I thought with my first book, we already were at that stage, but I switched my analysis quickly when I saw how the states stepped in in 08 and 09 with massive uh, subsidies, saving banks, uh, extending cheap money. So we had the phase of saving banks and cheap money that lasted until 2012, 13. Then we had the phase starting with negative interest rates. I mean, in 2012, Mario, Mario Draghi said, whatever it takes, we will do. And then with negative interest rates, something is already a, an element of force of state planned intervention, which I thought in a free market economy could never happen. So this is a clear indication of state intervention. And at least since the COVID pandemic, we have outright state interventionism, not only monetary policy, which is a soft tool, but direct state investment, direct investment, direct state spending, uh, by direct subsidies, uh, let's say for business or people hurt by the crisis, but also for Green New Deal programs. Um, the US is doing a historic infrastructure program. This is direct state spending, which is of course directly going into the economy. There too cannot be repaid. This, the public debt that accrues will not be repaid, but who cares at this point? Um, my proposal, unfortunately not taken seriously for Germany, was to, to float a loan for 2 billion euros and spend half of it on education and infrastructure and half of it put in a stock fund. In, uh, so buy stocks like Norway does or Switzerland does. Of course, no, it wasn't implemented because this is not the plan. Um, so you could get rid with, of the uh, huge debts we have now in the West. And it went on and on and on. I mean, there were clear signs. This was ending by 06. And then we had the state stepping in and the state got ever more directed, ever more forceful in stepping in. So we had the piling up of debts continuing. But basically, you can get rid of it by inflation, which we have now. And it's not the Ukraine war that started it. Of course, it's now accelerating it. Uh, but it was convenient to blame it. We, you could do it by um, taking some away from somebody and giving it to somebody else. So wealth transfers, be it through, through taxes or through special measures, whatever. Um, you can also, of course, just cancel debt or rearrange debt or reschedule debt. Uh, all of these are wealth transfers. So we need, uh, there will be more state intervention to get us out of this. If you look about uh, the stimulus packages, um, the lower one is the New Deal. This is in real dollars. This is in 2021 dollars. Um, so it inflation adjusted. The New Deal stimulus was about seven, eight thousand dollars per capita. And the Great Recession was uh, after 2009 was a bit more. And the COVID 
states going in full, uh, going all in. I mean, really spending a lot of money. Also, I mean, this um, leads you to more state control, to more state um, intervention. If you think about the Green New Deal that the ECB is planning, of course, you can now say, well, you company, you behave well, you get the credit. Company B, you don't behave well. And thus, there's bureau bureaucrats, again, administering this process. So it's as much direct central planning or central, let's say, allocation of resources. One thing that we thought we had overcome, but these things do come in cycles. And it's the only way to get out of this uh, debt crisis, except to really return to a tough monetary policy would immediately would bankrupt a lot of companies, would lead to massive um, uh, damage and um, some people propagate this, but I think the state intervention way is the more likely one. Mm, this just puts some of the um, four ways into where it happened. So, if, for example, devaluations in USA, in Europe, in Argentine. Um, and of course, you could also try the upper right side to grow your way out of the crisis, but it doesn't seem very likely this is happening. But uh, at least there's some investments in, in green technologies, in, in Green New Deal and technology. So some of it maybe come through growth, but there will be a lot of painful measures. Um, the lower left side is uh, re uh, reforming the currency, canceling debt, rescheduling debt. So administrative acts that will happen. We are already seeing debt being limited in convertibility, Russian debt. So once you do this to one country, you can start with other countries, you get used to it. Countries will do it probably for their own debt. We're just seeing the, the really the, the acceleration of state control over the economy. And of course, you can raise taxes. And uh, so I predicted unrest and civil war and saw the danger of big war even um, in my 2019 book. What I didn't see was that a very small uh, thing would play a big role, that a virus would play a big role. Um, and of course, the virus is real. We don't know about its origins. It, it seems to be pretty clear it, it was uh, man-made or man-modified, and it did come from China. Lots of things are popping up now that confirm various hypotheses, but I do not want to go into this. But one could see it um, because even in 2003, we had the SARS hysteria. And even then I thought, well, this not many, many people are dying. Why are people putting on face masks? What is happening here? I mean, I, I remember this pretty much. And of course, then we had uh, the pig flu in, in 09 and the avid flu in, in 13. And Ebola, of course, is a truly deadly virus that contained... <laughs> And then we have COVID and then we have the various variants. And I was very happy to see the vaccination mandate uh, defeated in German parliament. So, I mean, um, I worked against it at great personal and economic costs. I know many people who had their career ruined by speaking out against it. Uh, it was a big fight and we already, I, I was pessimistic by last fall. And then we had big turnouts in Germany on the streets in many, many cities. Let's say those people that said, okay, I did my first vaccination, I did my second, they promised me it would be over. I did my booster, they promised me, promised me it would really be over and still not over. What is happening here? So a lot of people that didn't think about this too much woke up. And, um, but of course, the fight is not over. The vaccination lobby is strong. And they are, will try to reintroduce it through the European level. That's the next fight. I mean, this is not over. Um, I go back. So all of these things, these state uh, interventions that we thought would be a thing of the past are happening now again. It's a border controls in Germany, but just for reasons of the virus, not for migration, of course. I mean, the German Minister of the Interior refuses to uh, check the identity of uh, refugees coming from Ukraine. Refuses. We are not the police is forbidden to check the identities. We're taking everybody in, and this has been official policy since 2015. I mean, this sounds to be crazy, but it is 
it is the case. Um, same in the, in the U.S. Now that Biden is there, doors are open again. So there's various interests that go cross currents. We have, of course, uh, uh, forbid demonstrations, uh, stop demonstrations. Schools are closed. Businesses are closed. Uh, data monitoring is much advanced. So there's lots of interests. I first wrote about it in a small book in 2016. And basically, it's the same interests that are behind the abolition of cash, because the more you go into the internet and into uh, electronic, the better you can be controlled. It's also big business for the, let's say, e-pay systems or for the pharmaceutical companies. So there's a very strong lobby behind this, which is not saying it's, it's um, bad per se, but it's just the political mechanisms behind it. Of course, I, I don't like it, but... One could have different opinions about this, but there's a strong lobby pushing us towards the internet, pushing us towards vaccination. And of course, once uh, things are done mostly remotely, I mean, we have a hybrid format here. I'm very grateful for this. But once you do things mostly remotely, I mean, you can be influenced, you can be shut off, you can be controlled, you can be monitored. I mean, so there's huge interest behind this transformation to go to completely digital. Um, Klaus, Klaus Schwab, um, the pandemic represents a rare opportunity to reflect, um, reimagine, reset our world. He wrote his book, The Great Reset. Of course, I gave an interview about it one and a half years ago, which was clicked about 600,000 times on YouTube. And then, of course, Der Spiegel, our major weekly, uh, wrote an article quoting me that I was uh, propagating the obscure idea that Klaus Schwab had the idea to reset our world. <laughs> this was very obscure. Uh, so, I mean, you this is how you can frame things and um, you can still get across in social media, but um, they are taking back the internet. I mean, it's more and more getting under control, under censorship. So the free internet it all, I always thought this is a brief period. I never believed it, but we are seeing it in many cases, many ways disappearing or rapidly dwindling, it, dwindling as we speak. Um, well, because all of this was foreseen in this Rockefeller report, I'm not sure all of you are familiar with this from 2010 Rockefeller Foundation. It's a public report. It puts out a few scenarios for the future of technology. One scenario is called lockstep. And basically it goes like this. A virus from China will hit the world, million dead. China will react autocratically, uh, authoritative. The West will not. Uh, face masks, data, uh, scanning, uh, massive use of data, shutdown of uh, borders interruption of supply chains, all of this is in there and you can download it. It's uh, 2010. And then at some point, policymakers in the West will notice it's better to go about this in a more authoritarian manner and then the West will adjust. There will be protests, but by and large, people will swallow it. This is a scenario publicly developed in, in, in this report. I did myself when I was still in favor was the powers that be I wrote uh, was a contributor to this vo volume technological totalitarianism um, lots of people wrote there Sigmar Gabriel uh, Martin Schulz uh, Matthias Döpfner from Springer so this was quite let's say high level volume of course today I'm not invited to write about those things anymore this is how things go um or Shoshana Zuboff from Harvard talking about surveillance capitalism, which we are in. So, I mean, capitalism and socialism can be pretty similar. That's a great merit. Um, so, I mean, there's quite a few books about how capitalism has turned totalitarian or authoritarian. Oh, we have inflation. And of course, as I said, in, in periods like this, when everything is in turmoil, um, we get more direct government intervention. We got an increase in taxes. Johnson 
um, a conservative raised taxes in Britain to highest ever. I mean, I'm not sure that headline is right. I'm sure taxes were higher in the 70s, but maybe highest ever since. And healthcare taxes could be highest ever, but uh, of course, in the 70s, Britain had a marginal tax rate of 90% or 90 something percent. Um, so this is happening. Just yesterday, two days ago, Joe Biden said, I want a billionaire tax. So in some ways, we're going back to more socialist ideas. Bill Biden also said, I want Amazon to unionize. So there's now some counter movement to this big technology oligopolies. So we're in that phase where not only the geopolitical situation is, is very dangerous, as we all know, but also where states are taking much more control again over the economy. Um, how much let's say the interaction between state and large interest groups, how that will be redefined, we'll see. Because of course, um, for the past 70, 80 years or so, the West at least has run on the, uh, on the American English model of state, which is basically non-state or little state. 70s was slightly different. So there may be some re redefinition also. We are, as, as the Chinese would say, in interesting times, but personally, I'd prefer to live in somewhat less interesting times. Thank you.